All right, recording has started. Okay, welcome back everyone. This is uh, our second lecture today on uh, Christian apologetics. And um, thank you for the um, discussion of the earlier session on uh, science and faith. Uh, we went through some thoughts on that. I'm going to go forward to the next chapter, which is chapter four on creation and uh, uh, if there are any questions that come up, you know, we will keep some time today to discuss that. And also, you know, we will continue this next week. Uh, we want to address additional questions on creation from a scientific perspective. So we will do that uh, as we go forward next week. So let me just share my screen. This PDF is available, has been made available to you um, in the... Uh, One minute. Sorry. <clears throat> Says I can't show your screen. Let me try again. Okay. All right. So we went through chapter three, science and faith, and we had some time for discussion. Let's move forward now to um, chapter four. We want to talk about creation, but we want to look at it from uh, from a science perspective, a scientific perspective. Now, um, if you are interested, uh, you could uh, read the, the book, The Case for a Creative by Lee Strobel. Uh, he's written a series of books on uh, the case for various various things. So, um, he, you know, that has a lot more information on it if you want to. Uh, look at it, but I'm, I want to just give us in a you know in a one lecture format, or maybe it might spill over to two lectures. Let's see, but in a very simple way, here are some things to keep in mind from a scientific perspective that are actually pointing us to a creator and creation. Right now, each of these can be explored further. There's a lot more information you could get into, but we'll highlight uh, a, a few things. Right. So, uh, as we have already uh, say, stated, right, that you know, the more we make advancements in science, the more amazing God is to us. Right? Science is uh, is just confirming uh, more and more to us uh, about our belief in God, and we don't see science as an uh, contradictory to our faith. Now, yes, there are questions we. There are big questions that science puts forward to, which we should handle, and to the extent we can. Right? Now, science, uh, I like this quote, science does done right, is uh, actually pointing us to God, not away from God. So let's look at, uh, you know, we will go through six of these, uh, six perspectives, I mean, six different streams of science, um, which, and when we look at from all of these different streams, uh, there are things that are, you know, there are that are pointing us to God, right? and so we just want to highlight that. So first, from cosmology. So cosmology is the study of the origin of the universe. So there are people who dedicate themselves to the study. A lot of that has to do with astronomy, and uh, it's it's a combination. You're bringing in a lot of things together uh, in order to try and understand how did the universe come about and therefore what are some of the things that are happening in the universe that would eventually of course be beneficial to the human race so cosmology is studying about the origin of the human race now uh, what are some things to keep in mind so first of all uh, uh, in this whole field of cosmology uh, 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 there is no such thing as uh, actually, practically, physically, in the physical realm, infinity. So infinity is a concept, but in the real world, everything has is finite. Right? In the real world, uh, infinity doesn't exist. We, everything is finite. It's as a concept. Infinity is a concept. The real world, things are finite. <clears throat> 
So when we look at our universe, and again, this is uh, uh, based even on Einstein's theory, theory of relativity, he's saying, okay, the universe is constantly expanding. If the universe is constantly expanding, if you go backwards in time, we can go back to a single point for its beginning, or when we say t is equal to zero, time is equal to zero. It goes back to a single point when everything started, right? And so this is the concept that uh, astronomer Fred Hoyle called as the Big Bang. Right? So he was, he coined it as the Big Bang. It means you're going back in time. So what we're saying is, uh, as far as our time realm is concerned, there is no infinite past, right? God is outside time, so he is eternal. But in the realm of time, we go back when t is equal to zero. Because the universe is always expanding. If it's always expanding, then it goes back reverse to say that there was a time when it began. And according to the Big Bang phenomena, that when you go back to t is equal to zero, what, what was there? There was timelessness, but there was great amounts of energy at t is equal to zero. Time was zero. That means beyond that, you're stepping into something unknown. Uh, that's timelessness. But at that time, there existed this huge amount of energy, which then caused, you know, the, the, the whole uh, release of that energy caused all of these things to eventually come into existence. So, but the presupposition there is there was this existence of so much of, you know, when you cross over t is equal to zero, there was the existence of all of this energy, which somehow was able to express itself in what we are seeing today as the universe, the world that we know of. So we are saying that at that instant in time, something so powerful happened. And you know, the scientists will calculate the amount of energy that was expended. And this was when T is so many billions of years ago, that's back in time when things began, so on. All that's fine. Okay, the calculation is done. This is our estimate of all the energy. Okay. But the presupposition is not just energy, but a lot of other things came into existence. It wasn't just energy crossing over time and coming into matter as we see it. There's also a lot of other things that came into existence. Intelligence came into existence. There was life forms that you and I, life forms came into existence. There was order that came into existence. So how can something, so the big question in cosmology is, we are saying, okay, we agree that there was a time when nothing existed. So science tells us there was a time nothing existed or that is because so there's only energy, we agree. But our, our question is, when that energy was expended, released, how did intelligence come? How did order come? How did life come? How did everything, all of this come into existence? Because the universe is not a chaotic, disorderly place. It's extremely ordered and you know it's, it's just amazing so how could energy cross over at that point into something that is so amazing so intelligent so full of purpose is our question in the study of cosmology the good thing is they're saying there was a time way back when 
when nothing existed, but there was what all this energy that caused some, all of this to come into existence. So to us, in the Christian faith, we say, well, that's the time God created. I mean, that's God, the creative act of God. God is light. I mean, the Bible uses those that language. God is light. God is power. God is infinite. And so when God spoke things into existence, that was the time all the energy and all the intelligence and all the everything, the design of God was released in that energy that was released to cause all these things to come into place the way it is. So it's not just a random explosion that suddenly came out so beautiful. No, the Almighty God, He was a source of both the power and the design. Now we can call it t is equal to zero. We call it the moment of creation. Fine. But God for us, God is the source of both the energy and the intelligence that we see today that has come into existence. So from a cosmological perspective, the study of the origin of the universe, that is how we can approach things. Okay? Second. Is uh, and so we, you know, we to believe that chaos was uh, the uh, chaos could birth order or lifeless matter produces these things. This counterintuitive is actually irrational. Okay. Secondly, evidence from physics. So when you look at physics and you study things that are around us, again, this is just a summary. There's a lot, lot, lot of things you can get in physics. What we are seeing is when we study the universe and the world around us, that there are, you know, we refer to them as parameters or constants. In our world and even in the universe at large, that are very, very precise, precise values. And as physicists or people who study all of these point out, it's because these are so precise and are at the value that they are, that life is possible or the universe is the way it is. That even a small change in the values of these parameters or these constants, even a small change, would uh, be devastating. So, for instance, uh, gravity, uh, we know, yeah, that's, that's, that's part of our world. And um, it's so fine-tuned that even, it, you know, even if it's uh, changed by small, small, you know, a billionth upon a billionth of an inch. Even if it moved by that, it changed by that, so to speak. It, life on the planet would not exist. And like this, there are many more, I think about 30 some parameters, maybe more. Uh, that are so precisely tuned or set in our universe. So we're not just talking about gravity, we're talking about 30 or more parameters. Uh, another one we could reference is the cosmological constant, which is the energy density of empty space, that um, the energy in empty space, energy density in empty space is so precise, so fine-tuned, that uh, if that were to change, the universe would collapse. So when you begin to look at all of these constants and say, hey, this is like at this 
this is at this and we can study we can evaluate we can arrive at uh, you know these values or we have arrived at these values and then we see how important they are that if this if it wasn't like this the result could have been so devastating or things would not be in existence the way they are so then you need to ask the question you know the fine tuning of the universe whether it's what have what is here on our earth or in the universe at large that when you look at all of these parameters and you're saying everything is so perfect it's so fine-tuned then how could all of this have happened by chance it had to be the result of an intelligent work or an intelligent designer god as a creator as a designer so from a cosmology perspective second from a physical physics perspective third then we want to look at it from a study of astronomy that means you're looking at the universe but from a uh, the from a astronomer's perspective you look at the location of the planets look look at the location of all the suns and uh, you begin to look at things and then we say look even from an astro astro astronomy perspective if you just look at one of this the solar system you look at the sun look at the earth you look at the moon and you look at just how this uh, these planets uh, are revolving around the sun just this just we're just looking at one uh, solar system you're not even looking at the whole universe but just looking at this and looking at how this has been so precisely positioned and if the earth's position from the sun the earth's position from the sun were to be altered even by five percent this is mentioning this if our position the position of our planet from the sun was to be altered even just as little as five percent life would not be possible we get too close if we too hard you just move 5% the other direction, be too cold. Life would not be possible. So can you imagine the earth is positioned just where it is so that life, we can live. If it moves a little closer to the sun, everything will be roasted. Little bit away, everything will be frozen. Now, it's there. And it's staying there. It's not, you know, randomly shifting the sun. That's it. The Earth is revolving in its precise orbit around the sun. So, could this happen by chance? Could this, or was this intentional? And then you look at the composition of the sun, and. Uh, Again, it's the right Mars, the right amount of light and distance from the Earth and all of that, right amount of gravity, so on, so that life on Earth is possible. Could that happen by chance or was it intentional design? So we looked at cosmology, we looked at physics, and we looked at astronomy. And I'm just giving a high, le high level, you know, from all of these perspectives. When you're looking at creation, you're looking at things around us, you know, these are things we need to think about. Or when you look at it from a biochemistry perspective, you're looking at a cell, a single cell, right? So those who look at the cells, a single cell you say look how complex a single cell is one cell right and we know the the human body is uh, you know it's just made up of thousands of these cells 
but we're looking at one single cell. And a single cell is so complex in its design that uh, for even a single cell, tiny little cell, it's got these cilia, which are like the hair-like structures on the cell. There are about 200 of, each, 200 of them on a single cell. And uh, they, they serve certain purposes in protecting the body, the cell. Um, now, a single cilia, there was one hair-like structure on the cell, has about 200 pieces of protein in it, which are all connected there to make up that single hair-like structure on the cell. And then that single cilia, or cilium, right? Uh, uh, so these things are so connected uh, together that you say, like, how did all the all these proteins so connect in such a way to create this single hair-like structure? Right? And uh, we're just talking about one small piece of the cell, which is so intelligently designed. So we're saying now, well, if uh, that little part of the cell has been so precisely connected or designed, then you can see how all the other systems, are, uh, they're so complex systems, which, you know, so many cells, they make up the organs, tissues and organs and systems in our body, human body, and then not to think, not to count all the other animals that are there. And when you look at all of the plant, the vegetation, you know, everything is, again, there's a lot, lot, lot to talk about. You can talk about it. But going down to that single level, to the level of that psyllium, there is intelligence in one piece of the cell. The cell itself has so much intelligence. Then all that is made up thereafter, the organs and the systems in the body, there's so much intelligence. Where could all this have come from? Could all of this happen by chance? That, you know, if you go down to the smallest level, you find uh, intelligence and thereafter, you know, in the, in the composition of the entire human body or the body of animals or birds or plants or vegetation, there is so much of intelligence. Could all this have happened by chance? Or is there, is it the work of an intelligent designer whom we call God? Last two things. So, now from biochemistry, you go down to genetics or biological information. So, you know, a lot of the study in genetics began uh, uh, the previous century, and uh, Watson Crick looked or uh, look, helped us understand about the DNA, which is. Uh, the genetic information that is uh, uh, in every cell that comp composes our human body. So there are trillions of cells and every cell has this DNA. And uh, this DNA has uh, 23 pairs of chromosomes, about 30,000 genes, which then give the information to produce over 20,000 different kinds of proteins in the body. So there is information here in the genes, which result in the production of these 20,000 different kinds of proteins. So when you begin to look at that, I mean, look at the proteins that are formed. The proteins are really made up of uh, uh, the the right amino acids that, that are linked together. And for a single protein molecule, 
a single protein molecule. You need to have the right bonds between amino acids, right? And they need to be connected in a specific sequence to form that protein. So for just one molecule, for just one protein molecule, yeah, uh, sorry, for just, uh, for this, what do I say here? Yeah. So uh, for one protein molecule, you need these amino acids connected. And a single cell, a single cell would have about, say, about 500 protein molecules. A single cell, one cell, is going to have 300 to 500 protein molecules. But for a single protein molecule, you need these amino acids coming together in a certain sequence. That means the probability that these amino acids would just connect in that sequence. When somebody's determined it, it's like 10 to the power of, you know, one out of 10 to the power of 25. I mean, it's, it's so improbable that these amino acids would come and connect in such a way to create that one protein molecule. And a single cell, simple cell, requires about 300 of these protein molecules. We're not talking about complex cells, doing simple cell. So basically what we're saying is, look, when you go down to the level of genetics and you look at what's happening at the low level, even in the formation of these protein molecules, which are composed of these amino acids that are connected in a certain sequence, to say that these things would just come and connect like this in such an intelligent way, is there is such a high level of improbability that makes it impossible. Therefore, we are saying that there has to be design for these amino acids to come into place and then for these right amino acids to come and connect to give rise to that protein molecule. And for the right combination of those protein molecules to form the cell. We know that the information to do that is in the DNA. But where did the information come from? Where did the design come from? The DNA is carrying the information, but how did the DNA, how does the DNA know I have to carry this information? How do the amino acids know that we have to join together to form this protein molecule? And how do all those protein molecules know they have to come together to form the cell? And we're talking about a single cell. And the human body has so many different kinds of cells. So how did all this happen? Could all this have happened by chance? Or are we going to be convinced that there is intelligence even at this level within the cell? And lastly, and we touched on this uh, in our class last week, uh, when we look at it from a psychology perspective. So we're looking at different streams. We looked at cosmology, we looked at physics, uh, we looked at uh, astronomy, we looked at uh, uh, biology uh, or biochemistry, and then we went down to genetics. Now, when you look at it from a, from a psychology perspective, and you say, well, of course, in, in, in creation, we have us humans, and all of us have a brain. And for all of us, the brain is designed the same way, the physical brain. But yet, and I'm sorry, again, I'm just speaking in general terms. You know, we know that there could be variations, but in generally speaking, our brains are all designed the same way. 
but our minds are all different that's what makes us all different our thoughts our beliefs our passions our emotions each one of us uh, you know exp have different uh, expressions and we are at the physical level generally speaking the brain is an organ uh, that has similar structure for all of us but we're all not the same you know we have a different expression of what we call as the mind which is expression of our thoughts our feelings and our temperaments all of that which is very very different so there's something there's a there's another level that is different even though the underlying organ is the same and then in addition to that this is a physical organ but there is the expression of what we are talking what we mentioned last class last week of morality and rationality so not only do we have the mind but then we also have morality a sense of right and wrong and we have the ability to reason rationality which is all coming out of this physical one physical organ or you know and, and then of course psychologists try to study that whole area of the mind and trying to understand how all of that happens so that becomes another question how come you know uh, matter and the same matter for the most part is being expressed in so many different ways or there are the, these expressions of the mind of um, morality of rationality coming out and uh, where did that come from and how uh, you know where could it could it have come from so what we're doing is what we are saying is that and we've just picked six of these that you know you look at different streams of science whether you're talking about cosmology astronomy physics or you're talking about biochemistry you're talking about genetics you're talking about psychology you're looking at different streams of science that in each of these there is the opportunity to encounter God because you come down to the same question that there is so much of intelligence there's so much of design in, uh, in all of these things in every, every every stream of science you're coming face to face with intelligence you're coming face to face with design and and for that intelligence to happen by chance is so improbable so improbable highly improbable that we say that it's, it's it's just say it's impossibility so therefore there has to be a god and so our response is look the scriptures are telling us you know that uh, we we must encounter god in his creation and you know then he's a personal god he wants to relate to us and help us understand him at a personal level okay so uh, there are books that you can read there's uh, places uh, you know you could explore this even further i'm going to pause here and i want us to just um, you know have some discussion and uh, answer uh, you know uh, questions on this okay um, i see several hands up um i don't know who put the hand up first but uh, <laughs> whether it's samuel or christopher please go ahead one of you and then the other one can ask you a question Go ahead, Samuel. Um, Christopher? Sorry. Uh, or Samuel, go ahead. Yeah, okay, thank you. Thank you, Pastor. Uh, <laughs> my mute was on. Um, so, Pastor, there's one branch of science uh, that 
that I find uh, is bit challenging. Like, like for, with physics, biology, I don't see these branches of science directly, uh, you know, contradicting existence of God. But, but I see them as magnifying, glorifying God when, when you know, biology takes us deeper into cells and how they are structured in so much order. It's, uh, it's just so marvelous. Um, However, uh, I think uh, there's uh, this branch uh, of science called anthropology, uh, which seems to be catching up a lot these days, which is nothing but uh, it's, it's archaeology, history, sociology, all of that combined. But it's, it's, a, it's a study of how human beings came to where we are right now. And this is the branch that, uh, and it even co combines evolution and whatnot. So uh, it, I think it talks about Java man, Neanderthals, uh, all of that, like where civilization started from, and all of that, and uh, and uh, so this is that branch which advocates a lot that human beings were it, the the most logical conclusion is human beings were hunter gatherers uh, when they were initially coming together as tribes, uh, like, because agriculture happened very late, so uh, people initially they would hunt. Uh, or they would gather uh, fruits, you know. So, so that, and uh, this kind of the, the story of uh, anthropology is, I think, completely opposite of the Bible, where uh, uh, it. I think uh, the study goes to say like how people from hunter gatherers, or they even call them foragers, uh, uh, how they would, uh, you know occupy a place, uh, hunt and gather in that place, uh, completely deplete that place, and then move to another place, and, uh, and, and so on. They moved on uh, in, in that context. Uh, and uh, so, uh, so uh, the values that they had, systems that they had were, were different, meaning uh, like one, one value that they, the prime, 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 I mean, the most uh, primary value that they had was of sharing. Like if I kill an elephant and I get it, uh, I can't consume the whole elephant by myself. So I share it with the tribe. Uh, similarly, one who gathers a mango and brings that mango will not fulfill his stomach. So he shares it. So, so that whole study goes into you know sharing being the primary value. Um, uh, there's there's no marriage uh, and kids. Whoever kids are born, it's like the whole tribe's responsibility to raise the kids. Until uh, the agricultural revolution comes into play, somebody discovers agriculture, and then uh, the person says, "Like, okay, I, I'm not going to go hunting and gathering. That's too dangerous. I, I'll just uh, harvest wheat uh, in my backyard. So this land is mine, uh, and I'll I'll I'll, I'll uh, labor on this land, and whatever fruit will come, so I'll consume it for myself. But I need helpers. So then, then agriculture then goes on to institute other components of society like marriage, uh, religion, uh, country, region, uh, tribe, and so on and so forth. So, so that is um, something and that's catching up. Like these days you pick up any book, you pick up uh, the best sellers of these days uh, that talk about humankind and whatnot, uh, generally have their context based on anthropology. So. So, but when we when you look at Bible, Bible starts directly with agriculture, with with Adam being uh, given instructions from God to uh, uh, to toil the land and and harvest, and then uh, Cain and Abel being agriculture. So, I think that I see that as a direct contradiction. So, so even though anthropology does not deny uh, bluntly, uh, explicitly the existence of God, but I think in in all its presentation in terms of how human beings. Can, from Java man and cavemen to Neanderthals became civilized society. I think it uh, it goes on to imply that uh, religion was a discovery by man uh, born out of the agricultural revolution. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, yeah, good. So to some extent, we are going to address this. So what we are going to do is um, we're going to talk about um, actually what we have done in the past and maybe I will expand it uh, for this year is we we look at Darwin's theory uh, this whole uh, theory of evolution how things have evolved and uh, we will while we and, and we will also look at the Big Bang theory of uh, cosmology 
So we look at those two, we will uh, try to understand that. So the Big Bang Theory is talking about how everything started. Darwin's Theory is talking about how man evolved. And now when we talk about that, I will expand it to include uh, what you have mentioned uh, uh, to see you know, what, what is being presented to us here in this whole field of anthropology and uh, and, and in, it relate you know and, and in your combine in with um, uh, sociology and how like exactly what you said uh, so how do we respond to that from a biblical perspective and I'm not saying that we are going to have answers for everything uh, because you know some of the questions that we will talk about later on is for example uh, things like uh, the age of the earth and the age of things that we find you know how do we respond to it we're not saying that we will have, uh, you know, uh, great answers, but we will have our response uh, to to these things, right? So we will um, uh, uh, expand on what we have been typically doing to include that this, you know, in our, I think, next lecture, uh, when we cover, we'll look at Darwin's theory, and then we'll also look at Big Bang, and uh, we will expand it. And then, uh, and then we'll answer these questions. We will say, okay, this is how we respond to it, uh, or this is how we understand it, uh, but from the information we have in the Bible and from what is being presented to us through these uh, various streams of science. Okay, so uh, thanks for bringing it up and we will address it. Thank you. Thank okay. you. Okay. Christopher, I think you were uh, the next one who had to raise the hand, then I see Charles also. So Christopher, you want to present your question or discussion? Uh, yes. Um, so this is in relation to, uh, I think maybe you, you already uh, answered that, but this is in relation to the, uh, uh, you know, when, uh, you know, when Adam uh, was, uh, was created and in a sense when, when the when the earth was but Christopher you are far away from the microphone. Yeah Christopher we can't uh, it's a little faint. Uh, can we hear you better? Yes so uh, I I wanted to just uh, uh, I mean this is actually in reference to you know when when Adam was uh, created in, in a sense when when the when the when the world was created and uh, 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 in the Bible, so uh, with science, they have they have uh, tried to establish um, through in, through through research, uh, you know, trying to uh, you know look at rocks and look at you know uh, you know look at uh, uh, different um, natural uh, structures, and uh, it goes back. Um, uh, many, 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 you know, uh, centuries, uh, or many, many years before before that. So, how, how does that kind of, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, tally with, you know, what what uh, what uh, what uh, the Bible says and what um, uh, you know what what science uh, comes up with? So, this is the question we will we will address, which has to do with time. Right. So, the Bible in in Genesis one and two is describing for us uh, a six day work of God um, that took place, bringing in man and you know all of the things that we see on the planet, and yet. So therefore, we're saying, okay, people are only so many years old, uh, so many thousands of years old, and so on. And then uh, we have um, science, like Chris was saying, you know, that that when we do so dating through the scientific process, we say, okay, the Earth is so many thousands of years, hundreds of thousands of years old, and so on and so forth. So that there's a, there's a huge discrepancy between the six thousand years time that presented to us in the Bible and what science is presenting to us of hundreds of thousands of years. So how do we respond to that? 
uh, we will, uh, so I will share with you maybe, yeah, in the next class. Um, we we'll probably do those questions first and then move into the chapter on Darwin and Big Bang. So uh, we will pick, pick up these questions in the next class. We'll pick up these questions, then move into the chapter on Darwin and uh, Big Bang. So uh, how do we respond to that? And I will also share with you some of the different Christian perspectives. Right? Just to give you an idea, and we will get into details next week. Uh, there is... And again, uh, I, I don't want to say this conclusively, but I'm just giving you, presenting to you some of the different Christian responses to that. So one of the Christian responses to that is between Genesis 1.1 and Genesis 1.2, uh, there is the possibility of, or what people say, uh, that there could have been a long time period be before uh, we see uh, the uh, creation of man and, 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 and things on the earth. So that is one perspective that which you may read. So I will share, with, share this with you, and then I will share with you what I, how I would respond to this time question. So that is one perspective, that between Genesis 1, 1 and Genesis 1, 2, and you may read you know, some of these Christian responses some in some places so you'll find some christians who say that between genesis 1 1 and genesis 1 2 uh, there was a big time gap uh, that's why we have the earth being dated as so many thousands hundreds of thousands of years back or they may even state that there could have been a prehistoric a pre-adamic race especially when you come to you know, the fossils uh, and even the fossils of some animals like dinosaurs and others, which are dated to many hundreds of thousands of years. Now we are saying uh, uh, from Genesis 1, 1, it's 6,000 years, but the fossils are dated many hundreds of thousands of years. Or So how do you account for that? So one Christian response is that there must have been a pre-Adamic world. So I'm not saying this is true. I'm just saying this is a response that you would read. Um, that there, is, uh, uh, there was a pre-Adamic world uh, that existed before, between Genesis 1, 1 and Genesis 1, 2. That's why Genesis 1, 2 says, the earth was without form and void and darkness was on the face of the deep. So that means uh, there was water so that God had destroyed the pre-Adamic world with a flood. Okay, that's one. Now, uh, uh, I know time is running out, but uh, do I, you know, personally, do I believe that? Uh, I don't. And uh, maybe next next class I will explain it. But that is one response people have. But just to say this, you know, uh, there's the other thing to consider, which I did mention in the last class, which is that in the creative work of God. Every time, energy and intelligence or design was compressed in a moment. So even if the earth was created in an instant, and then you examined what was created, you would say, well, this is a product of hundreds of thousands of years. But in the creative act of God, hundreds of thousands of years was compressed into an instant. So that is another response. And I personally like to take that response as opposed to the previous one that I mentioned. Right? We will consider both. We will consider both of these next class and, uh, as a response to the time question. And we will, you know, we can look at both sides and see the pros and cons, and evaluate it. Is that okay, Christopher? But I think we will pick it up next class because uh, it does require uh, some amount of discussion. Okay. This whole issue of time and how do we answer when uh, things are dated hundreds of thousands of years? How do we respond to it? Okay. So. Charles, can we take your question next class?
I see your hand up as well. Okay. Um, so what we will do next week is we will continue this discussion and answer some of the questions that come in relation to creation. Then we will proceed to talk about this whole theory of evolution, things evolving over time, which from Darwin on, Darwin on. We will spend some time on that. And then we will spend some time on the Big Bang Theory. Let's understand it and say, okay, this is what they say, so what, right? And along the way, I just make mention of some hard books that, uh, that are out there. Uh, I'm not saying you have to go read it, but just, just for us to be aware. Uh, authors like uh, Richard Daw Dawkins and uh, Stephen Hawking and others, that these are books that, uh, we, you know, just be aware that these are kind of books out there which generally people are reading from which their questions would come. And, uh, you know, we need to understand where they're coming from and uh, be firm in where we stand and understand where we stand. So we will go through that next week and probably another week after, right? Uh, so we will spend maybe two more weeks on this whole aspect of science creation and related matters, related issues, uh, and address them. Is that okay? Uh, come with your questions. Take some time to think. We will ask questions, discuss, and uh, then move forward into other topics. We're going to bring this lecture to a close. So um, I just was... Uh, 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 okay. Sure, Charles, we'll pick up your question next week. So I'm going to stop the recording. Let's close in prayer, and we'll take our break and get ready for...